see Mr. Booth, I actually did have a question. Sure, go ahead. So that, that quiz that we took over the weekend, um, right. I could definitely be wrong about it, but I think one of the answers like wasn't showing up. It had, oh, like, you are lots. correct, and I gave everybody credit that I've checked so far. I think some of you may have taken it after I checked it. I had two of uh, one guy and then none of the, the uh, lot. We needed lot. We needed right. more lot. Okay. Sweet. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I will try to debug more carefully in the future. But anyway, uh, let's press on. I guess I'll share the screen. You want to be able to share computer sound. But that can be problematic. All right. 103. What are we on to today? Exodus. Uh, Exodus? Exodus, yeah. And Proverbs. Don't let me forget Proverbs at the end. I always get excited about Exodus and then leave out Proverbs. All right, so uh, here's a uh, map. Uh, Journeys of the Israelites uh, in the, the little dotted line. So I had to get across the Red Sea and spend a lot of time wandering around. Um, so as is the case with uh, some major hero stories, uh, we have the uh, story of the youth of Moses, um, the story of uh, the rest of the um, Pentateuch, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy uh, is largely the story of Moses and his uh, relationship with uh, the Israelites and also his relationship with God. <clears throat> and so he becomes the lawgiver later on in this uh, book. But early on, he was born a time where uh, they were trying to uh, minimize the number of uh, male slaves that they had by killing off the children. Um, yeah, it's not totally unrelated to the fact that we're giving forced sterilizations in our uh, concentration camps for um, um, immigrants. So uh, they're worried about being outnumbered, those Egyptians. Um, hold on. That's a little better. Um, and they start killing uh, the sons. And in the ancient world, it was fairly common to, uh, you know, you raid a village, you kill all the men and enslave the women and uh, children. Maybe kill the male boys too. Um, so Moses' sister, um, Miriam, is put in charge of hiding him in the bulrushes. Oh, stupid me. Um, I knew I was forgetting something. Put a pin in it with Moses in the bulrushes. Uh, we'll be back there momentarily. Uh, but first, uh, the history of writing, part two. We talked about part one, didn't we? I Do you think remember? we did. Yeah. We were etching we in clay. Tablets. Right. Um, okay, so uh, we're moving on. Uh, scrolls in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Um, so to have writing the way we think of it, <clears throat> one of the things you need is an alphabet. That's the code you use uh, to record words onto whatever uh, surface you have. Hebrew is a consonant alphabet. That is, uh, the major letters, the big letters, are all uh, consonants. And the, he the smaller letters are these little dots. So you see here, uh, they have a system of dots. 
uh, that came along much later to indicate that you are um, writing, uh, you know, to indicate what, um, what vowel it is. So imagine if I put that on my door, what would I be saying? Be right back. Be right back. What's missing? The I and the A and the right. E. Right, right. All the vowels. Uh, so that's the way Hebrew is written. Um, except from left to right, so to make it more confusing. I guess it's not confusing if you grew up with it. Um, so you're always having to figure out what the vowels are. Now, when it came time to make vowels for Hebrew, because they are an incredibly useful thing, they do the pointing. That's the little dots, they call them points. Uh, here we go. Oh, go away, not you guys. All right, so you can see how the dots relate to the bigger letters uh, in a couple of places here. Um, and that's because the Hebrew consonants are inspired by God. God, you know, big, and the vowels are our attempt to interpret God's word. And so we don't want to have people mistake the pointing for the consonant. So you don't make up new uh, full letters uh, to push in there because you don't want to mess up what God had um, you know, uh, said by mistaking one vowel for another. Oh, I'm in the wrong thing. What happened to my history of writing? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Closed out the wrong window. All right, so Hebrews come up with a consonantal alphabet. Uh, Greeks uh, come up with the first uh, full alphabet. Um, Well, that's only the capital letters. I kind of like. Okay, so here we go. And um, now I think the idea of going from uppercase to lowercase came along much later. So it would be either written early on in all capitals, uh, which they called uncials, or all lowercase letters, which they called majuscules. Uh, minuscules, minuscules, minuscule. Um, and all the letters are there, including the, uh, um, including the vowels. So uh, the Greeks and the Hebrews have an argument about who created the, uh, actually created the alphabet. Uh, the pride of place for the word uh, for what they created goes to the Greeks. Uh, because where do we get alphabet? It's from alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Um, what we've learned growing up was not the alphabet. We learned our ABCs. Um, all right. So we've got the alphabet. We've got the code we're going to use. Now we need the writing surface uh, that we're going to use. We were using tablets of clay. Uh, now we're going to use something uh, somewhat reminiscent of paper. If you notice the word papyrus, mm. 
Um, the, I believe the modern English word paper comes from the uh, Greek word papyrus. So let's look at papyrus, hopefully. Yeah, we papyrus look. is a reed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah see it here? Uh, some years ago, uh, people in Egypt decided to uh, start making papyrus again as a kind of display, uh, historical display. And Egypt has a well-functioning government to some degree, and they had wiped it out as a noxious weed. So they had to go next door, I think, to Somalia, maybe the Sudan, um, and get some out of their ditches uh, and bring it back to Egypt. Let's see if the slideshow still works. Ah, look. Okay, let's make some papyrus. This would be a great, like, science. Why won't they get bigger? Science fair project. Okay, so these are papyrus, also known as bulrushes, also known as the place that Moses was hiding. Uh, thank God for Moses hiding in the bulrushes. It reminded me of paper. I always thought it was like the cane poles until I started studying it. Uh, the cane poles that we make fishing poles out of, but ours are hollow, theirs are not. And that's the key to what's about to happen. You cut the cane stalk, you peel away the outer green uh, layer and underneath it's white. You cut that into strips. Then you soak it really well. Roll it up, it's starting to make me hungry. Um, then you take this wet, uh, rolled out, flattened uh, papyrus, uh, lay some up and down and some across. Now in the left to right or right to left, if you're in a writing system that's horizontal, the side, that, the, uh, side of the paper that goes left to right is called the recto or the right side and the back is called the verso because it's the reverse. And generally, you don't want to write on it, and that's why it makes sense to roll it up into a scroll. Uh, now, this is a modern press, but of course, you can do uh, just as well with a few rocks. Uh, you smush it for about a week, and you bring it out. Uh, you scrub it down with some pumice, make it smooth, and uh, you can rub chalk into it. Like not the chalk, you, you know, I don't know if y'all even remember chalk on a chalkboard, uh, but back in the day we had that, but this is the raw like chalk rock, and you could rub it down and make it gleaming bright. Okay, now I need it to go away. So that is a uh, writing surface A. It was invented in Egypt, uh, kind of a closely guarded product. Um, they made a ton of it. Uh, it was relatively inexpensive, relatively. Still expensive because it's handmade, right? Okay. Uh, now let's look at parchment, which is made out of animal skin. Um, so the animals are cow, calf, goat, sheep. I think they even made pig. I'm not sure if Jewish people would use pig parchment, though. It seems like a bit of a, you know, I know it's unclean to eat. So you skin the animal. Um... We don't tan it though. So um, you usually dye the leather so it's a brownish color. We leave this uh, light colored. You scrape, scrape, scrape the fat away. Ah, yeah, Pergamon, we were going to go there next. Um, then you stretch it out. You could use that for a drum if you were so inclined, uh, but after it dries, oh yeah, this is the first, why are they doing this backward? This doesn't make any sense. Um, this is semi-finished. So we go from skinning the animal. Here are the animal skins. You still have hair on one side and skin, um, 
meat and fat on the other and you have to scrape all that off. So first you put it into a barrel of lime and the lime, um, you let it loosen up the, um, the hair and the fat. And then you stretch it out on that and start scraping. Let you try it first. Now, this is a machine that does that. But back in the day, you had a little knife looking thing with two handles and you would just scrape it, scrape it, scrape it. Um, then you stretch it out. Oh, there's a scraper. Yeah. And that one just has one. You can put your sheepskin on it. That's the 13th Amendment on parchment. Okay, let's go to Pergama. Now, this is one place I wish we could uh, be together because I've actually got some papyrus and some parchment to pass around, but the papyrus is rough. It's also rather brittle. The parchment is much more supple. Uh, it's a better writing material, but of course, uh, being animal skin rather than plant matter, it's much more expensive. Oh, we're going to look around Pergama. Uh. Is this Pergama? Hmm, I must be spelling it wrong. Pergamena, okay. So we'll look at some of the various parchments you can buy. Uh, here's cut sheets. We'll look at that. If you want to, these are what, $20 a sheet. Uh, you can get goat parchment, deer parchment. That's the one I was missing. So venison, you don't want that skin to go to waste. Uh, sheep, calf. Um, now your most expensive parchment is uterine calf skin. And you can see why you kill a pregnant cow, you take out the calf, the skin is really thin and delicate. Um, and also there's very little of it. Um, so it's quite pricey. I don't even see that on here. Goat, sheep, calf, calf, calf. It doesn't say it is, but it doesn't say it isn't. All right. Okay, so that's the writing surface. What else do we need? Oh, I know. We need quills from a goose. So these are old fashioned quills. You notice that the end is, uh, the end is something you make with your blade. Now, modern quills, normally if you buy one uh, at a, one of these Michaels, uh, normally they'll have a, they may have a feather, but there'll be a nub there, which is a modern metal, um, you know, uh, and it's shaped in such a way, you know, in the proper pin fashion, so it's easier to write with. But these are the old fashioned kind. They made it the old fashioned way. Did I show you sheets of papyrus? You can actually buy those. I ordered some, not ancient papyrus, but newly made papyrus. Um, it looks pretty good if you're an art type person, you know, something different 
to make, uh, you know, make your painting a zone. It gives it kind of a cool look. Any art type people? <laughs> art type. <laughs> okay, what do you think, Riley? Would you want to use some of that? I think it'd be really interesting to see like modern art styles drawn on ancient styles of paper. And I've got one in my office. It was actually, um, what's the thing they do at t-shirt places, uh, screen, you know, it's not actually painted, painted. It was, they used us. What is it that you didn't, you know what I'm talking about? I'm not a clothing person. Okay. Well, anyway, when is you make t-shirts, what is it called? Is it called screen printing? Okay, maybe. And it's screen printed. You can tell because it's not perfectly aligned. But anyway, you use that. By the way, uh, have you seen any papyrus being used in modern applications? Look more closely. This has papyrus aesthetics. Yes. My web page is one of the few web pages in the world that's written on authentic Egyptian papyrus. And do you know why? You wanted to stand out? Well, that and it's optimized for scrolling. Ooh. <laughs> that's a dad joke. That's my favorite dad joke. Because scrolling. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Papyrus it's, scroll. Right. It's a terrible joke, I know, and I'm so proud of it. I tell it every quarter. Um, <laughs> but it is, right? Well, the real reason is I wanted something that looked good uh, and different from everybody else. And since you, you know, I've got a pretty big website and you lose the tactile part of um, when you, um, Use the, you know, you can't touch it directly, but if it looks rough enough, you might can trick the mind into thinking, okay, I feel the texture almost. So uh, that's in a, you know, since we don't have actual paper, uh, papyrus uh, came in as an uh, alternative. You want to see my very first web page? Uh, oh, shoot. There we go. 1997. Where were you? <laughs> you guys weren't born yet, right? Not even conceived. Yeah. All right. Your parents hadn't met. All right. So this is my first web page. Uh, tribute to Star Trek and, uh, you know, the great beyond. Um, so anyway, as I studied design, I got more and more retro, like, you know, now I'm at the stay off my lawn stage. Um, all right. So, uh, the third part that we need is ink. Well, four parts. You need the alphabet, writing materials, the surface, um, the tool for doing the writing, the pen, and then the ink. And so, um, the simplest form of ink is carbon ink. Go to your nearest fireplace, reach up, rub your uh, hand on the chimney, and it'll come out black. And so that's the uh, black of that. And it stays black forever. It never changes color. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, all you need is some water and something to glue it, uh, a little gum put in there. Um, Carbon glue water. Yeah. Uh, the problem with uh, that kind of ink, it's, it's very watery. It's very thin. And so uh, you either have to rewrite over it several times or you're just stuck with looking at something that uh, you can, is kind of translucent on the page. Uh, so for ink uh, makes a nice black uh, ink and it's thicker. 
And this is again back in the day of water-based inks rather than oil-based inks. And you start with oak gall, traditionally. Uh, oak gall is uh, what happens when a bug bites uh, something on a, a, you know, bites an oak tree, and then the gall is like an infection. So, yeah. Um, but guess what? You can use acorns. You can use pecan shells. Do you know how bayous have that T-shaped color? Um, that comes from all the leaves that fall into the bayou. It's not mud. It's a, you know, the water has been colored by tannin. And so there are a number of ways to get tannin from plants uh, if you are so inclined. Uh, you also need iron salt, which interacts with the tannin to produce the black. Um, so the iron salt with the nut gall and gum to make it stick and water. And uh, this is still in use today, this uh, sofa ink. Uh, Right here, you can buy some for eh, not bad, fourteen twenty-five. I might buy some of that. It's an ancient recipe. Um, and so you would make these um, ancient scrolls and ancient codices eventually using tannin. Here's one. Now something happens to sofa ink over the centuries because it's made, did I say iron? Yeah, the iron salts. What happens to iron over time? It starts to rust away. Yes, and it changes color as it rusts. So is this still black? No, it has rusted to a rich brown shape. Now, if it were only iron, it would rust to iron, you know, rust color. But uh, in combination with all the other stuff, uh, as the iron rusts, it becomes a deep rich brown. Where have we seen that brown before? Can you see my website is not black uh, font? It is the hex number. And I, I, uh, I downloaded one of these pages off of a medieval manuscript and then uh, identified what color it was. It is 443322 in hex numbering. I think of that. Do you see it? So that's the color of rusty scribal ink. Uh, that I use on my website. Uh, yeah, it's clear I'm a little bit nuts, right? Okay, I think we're done with that. Let's um, talk about forming our book. So we've written it uh, on this paper parchment or papyrus, uh, and then you put it on a scroll. And this is a Torah scroll. Now, what is in the Torah? The Torah is all of the Old Testament. I don't remember how many books of the Old Testament there are. Right, it's the first five. So that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, Do you see one of the, well, we can see uh, two, pro oh, and notice how the pages are joined together. Uh, so there are three problems with the scroll. A, half of your space is unused, right? The back of the scroll, you aren't writing on it. Uh, B, what if you're reading along in Genesis and you want to cross-reference something in Deuteronomy? What are you going to be doing for the rest of the afternoon? 
Oh, you're you're muted, Riley. Unscroll, 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 right. unscroll, mm -hmm. constant unscrolling. You're going to be spooling that thing for the rest of the. So navigation is uh, a pain in the butt. Um, also, it gets unwieldy to the point that if you're not careful, you start tearing the pages. Um, so as a practical matter, uh, books are very short. Uh, you don't have a Bible. I mean, it can barely fit the first five books of the Bible onto a ginormous scroll that then has to be taken care of uh, super carefully. I think we have the dedication. Yeah. Instead of Kayla, you tore a new Torah scroll. This is a to you. Even if he inherited one from his parents, he still write his own. If he cannot physically write it, he appoints an agent who was safer right. to write it for him. If, we, if a person buys an incomplete safer to or he buys one that needs correction, and he corrects it, he also fulfills the mitzvah. However, to buy a safety which is complete, which is fully written, so then it's not so clear that he does the full of mitzvah of safety Yeah, yeah, It's important not just to write the Torah, but also to own it. The mitzvah is to have it in your possession, a safer Torah. Therefore, those who have a safer Torah do not donate it, oh. lend it. Uh, this way, the, the safer Torah remains in their possession. I'm sorry. Is it off now? Okay, for some reason, when I use the microphone, my video doesn't, I mean, my audio doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the heads up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very loud. I don't know. Um, I don't know uh, why I'm not hearing it. It's the way my microphone interacts with the rest of the machine. Yeah, I can, I can barely hear you over all the uh, Hebrew chanting. It oh, was, it's very loud. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, no, it was just, uh, just you could hear a very, <laughs> uh, the mur you're murmuring compared okay. to the video. Okay. Right. So anyway, uh, it's every Jewish adult or, or every Jewish man is supposed to write one Torah in his lifetime. And in more liberal Jewish circles, of course, uh, women are included. Uh, but you can see this is a very conservative sect. So each man who is not a sofa writes in a letter or two on the last day. Uh, oh, and you can see also these are all the upper letters. They don't have the pointing. Um, so you, where do you wind it up? Shoot. Ah, here we go. Wind up the scroll, wind up, wind up. Uh, and they're trying to be quick, but you have to also be very, very careful or you'll uh, tear it. So this is one scroll, one copy of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, and it's a big celebration because you don't buy one of these at your local Walmart. You pay a sofa to come and spend most of a year, um, or maybe he does it at home, I don't know, uh, but spends most of a year writing a scroll. So you have a parade, you, you know, put in a thing, big party, uh, and a loud party, as, <laughs> as you let me know. Sorry about that. Uh, wow. I blame Zoom. All right, so Torah is the first five books. And they call them books for just that reason. The normal size of a book, if you notice Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, they're all about the same length. You have first and second Kings. Why? Because it's too big to fit in a scroll. It's actually two scrolls worth. Uh, Psalms were parts one, two, and three. Uh, and so a scroll takes uh, 50,000 to 70,000 to 100,000 uh, dollars to create. Um, and that means ordinary people don't own books. Um, that won't happen until you hit um, 
the printing press, which brings down the price a lot. Okay, next phase, the codex. A codex is a book in the book form we're used to. Oh, here we go, all kinds of, um, so it's the form of the book that we're used to, um, you know, pages, binding, uh, cover, and it offered several advantages. Um, there had been, you know, something like uh, Codex in use before, like the 12 Tablets of Rome and stuff. Uh, but bringing it into widespread use were the early Christians who were barely able to afford anything. They were very poor. And so you're wasting half of your space uh, on the, uh, on the papyrus, because at that time they couldn't afford parchment. So let's, instead of putting it all into one long sheet, let's cut it up, bind it, and then all of a sudden you've got all these uh, advantages. Um, in addition to uh, saving paper, of course, it's easier to navigate, right? You can go from Genesis to Revelation with one big uh, flip of a a lot of pages at once. Um, and so it's easier to uh, cross index. Also, the psychology of the religious folks changes. Uh, when Jesus talks about the Hebrew sacred text, he says, search ye the scriptures, the things that have been written down, uh, which are in separate books. Um, for the Christian with their newly minted codex, all of the books are in one big book. And so they start to think of the Bible, the book, um, as in being one book. So you stitch it together. And so you can fit a lot more material in there. Um, oh, did I close out again? Of course I did. Uh, you can fit a lot more material into your uh, codex than you can into um, a, a scroll. Uh, the materials cost somewhat less because, you know, you're writing on both sides. Uh, it's easier to navigate, but it also does give you this idea that uh, it's all the same book, which can be a problem uh, when you've got people from centuries apart with very different insights, uh, you know, thinking it's all just God writing it all and dictating it. Um, so they had a little different attitude toward the scriptures, uh, such that they expected a lot of debate within Judaism, whereas uh, most Christian denominations think they have the answer and everybody else is wrong. All right, so it's expensive to make a scroll. How about to make one of those fabulous medieval manuscripts? Let's talk about the St. John's Bible. So a few years back in England, they um, decided they wanted a modern manuscript on the model of the medieval ones. Of course, it's not working. Let's see if we can find something else. Okay, so here's a page out of the St. John's Bible. They don't use King James. I forget what text they use. Uh, but here's the first page of Matthew. And they used, oops, they used the Queen's calligrapher, like a Queen Elizabeth, when he's not inviting people over for tea and crumpets. He wasn't busy with that job. He would be uh, making this translation or this uh, manuscript of uh, the uh, Bible, the full Christian Bible. Um, and here we're not using soot from your chimney. 
Uh, let's say he wants to write something in gold. What will he use for his ink? Is it, is it called gold leaf? Is that what it is? Yes, yes, which is made yeah. out of gold, right? It, you know, the little Wrigley spearmint wrappers that you can peel off. You know, you've got the, the foil thing. It's like that foil, but gold. Um, so all the books of the Bible in several codices, they're, yeah, and they're three feet high. When they're opened up, they're four feet wide. I think they're seven volumes because seven. How much would this Bible cost? Um, I don't think it's actually that expensive because I've had stuff. Well, it, it compared to a scroll, it's not that expensive. All right, give me your guess. How much is that Bible? Because remember, uh, this is all handmade too. Yeah, handmade. Uh, a scroll was. The scroll, the scroll was like is fifty to seventy-five, and really a hundred thousand. Um, I'd say maybe uh, ten thousand. Ooh, uh, you've got the ten right. Add a few zeros. Add three zeros. It's ten oh. million dollars to make that. Oh. Oh wow! Right. Now, you can buy a machine reproduction of it for a mere $175,000, or you can buy a house. Um, so, incredibly expensive, right? Average people didn't own the codex. Um, I'm going to show you this uh, tech support for transitioning from the scope to the codex, because it's just funny. And you can turn your thing down. I'm not going to talk over it if you need to. Yeah, okay. Can you all hear that? Yeah, what's up? 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 Yeah, what's Jeg åpner den, altså hvis det hadde vært så enkelt, så hadde jeg jo ikke tilkalt helpdesk, hadde jeg vel? Nei, det er ikke det. Vil du ha en kopp på en fond? Nei, det skal være fort gjort, jeg kan se. Du bare gjør... Sånn! Ja, da er vi i gang. Ja, altså så langt kom jeg altså. Ok. Men så stoppet det opp, og så var jeg redd for at noe av teksten skulle forsvinne, så jeg turte ikke å gå videre. Å ja, ok. Nei, men du skjønner at inni her, så ligger det kanskje flere hundre sider med lagret tekst. Så for å komme videre, så tar du tak i et ark, på den måten her, og så blar du over på neste side, sånn. Da fortsetter teksten der. Jeg blar, altså? Du blar, ja. Men når jeg skal tilbake, da? Ja, da bare blar du tilbake igjen. Ta tak der, og så gjør du sånn. Der, så er du tilbake til den teksten du hadde sagt. Ikke noe... Ok, så den slutter der, og så... Så fortsetter den der, da! Ok, men når jeg skal avslutte for dagen, hva gjør jeg da? Da bare slår du sammen permene. Ja? På den måten der. Sånn. Der lukker du, da ligger alt lagret inni deg. Ok, jeg risikerer ikke å miste noe av teksten her nå. Nei, alt ligger lagret inni her nå. Da må du i tilfelle sette fyr på, eller ja, det er kanskje litt sannsynlig. Ja, ok. Nei, men for det er noe med det at når du har holdt på med skriftruller, så tar det litt tid å konvertere til å bla i en bøk. Ja, ja. Ja, ok. 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 Ja, sånn, og så, hva du kalte det? Blar. Jeg blar. Ja, blar i det. Blar frem og tilbake. Ja, og sånn her ligger det helt ut. Ja, og når jeg er ferdig, så bare lukker jeg den. Ja, flott. Fint det, kjempefint. Ja, flott det. Ja, men du, det er en del, ikke sant? Nå er den sånn igjen, nå får jeg ikke åpnet den. Ja, men du, nå får jeg ikke åpnet den. Ja, men du, det er fra feil side. Du må åpne med å åpne fra andre siden. Så det er ikke likegyldig det, altså. Nei, du må åpne fra den siden der, sånn. Der, der er den åpnet. Ja, vel. Ok, do you feel like you know how to use your books now? I love that. Imagine being the first guy to be handed a codex, so. Oh, um, here's a Codex Sinaiticus. We already looked at part of it. It's on parchment, um, one of the most famous copies of the Greek Bible. And notice that they're writing in scripto continua, which is where you put all the words together. And one way you would read would be 
to read out loud, panta, that's a word, ta-aromata, ta-aromata. Uh, so that's two words. And you kind of would read out loud. One day, uh, Cicero wrote a letter saying uh, he couldn't do much reading today because he had a sore throat. Uh, so the thing your teachers told you not to do, I mean, the first punctuation was space between words, right? <laughs> uh, it's just amazing uh, how far we've come. Okay, was that it? I think we're close. Let me just look one more time, make sure we didn't skip anything. Because um, everything we read is through the uh, prism of being written down in some kind of book, but what kind of book that makes a difference? Oh, yeah. Um, let's move forward just quickly, eventually, um, and there's a saying, have y'all ever heard the saying, uh, information wants to be free? It's a computer world uh, saying, uh, which is uh, from the very expensive $10 million codex um, to, you know, the text itself literally being free, right? You can download it probably that same Bible for free somewhere. So the next step in this process is the printing press by Gutenberg with movable type. We won't go into this too much. You probably know this stuff. Uh, more people learning to read, the idea of democracy because people can be informed, therefore they can be citizens. A religious revolution because people could have Bibles of their own and read them. Uh, science, the information boom, photocopying comes along. Now we get the digital age. Oh, and this is Bruce McGee in digital. <laughs> How about that? Um, the Oxford English Dictionary is this huge volume of uh, it was at one time around $2,000, but you could buy the CD for $300. So what are you paying for with that $1,700 when you buy the physical copy? Uh, I'm assuming the copying cost and then the right. transportation and all that. Yes, because it costs a lot of money to move a ton of books. It's probably a hundred pounds. <laughs> um, so, um, oh, and it is twelve ninety on uh, on Amazon, and of course, although it's not free because you're paying tech to be there, uh, but when you're a student, you can use the OED online at Tech's website for free, and it's also the old copies of it are stored on the archive, Internet Archive, and you can use it the way you use a dictionary, um, just on a PDF. <clears throat> And so this is what a computer used to look like when it was typing. And here's the guy who changed that, Steve Jobs. Okay, watch your ears. I'm going to play. Uh, this is a short clip. But he's talking about applying all of this stuff that we've been studying today to the computer. Because he's the guy that had that idea. Oh, that's Thank too you. long. We don't want to listen to the whole thing. And uh, this is the closest I've ever gotten to a college graduate. They decided at the last minute that they really wanted a girl. For six months, I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was, spending all the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. It was pretty scary at the time, but looking back, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. <laughs> the minute I dropped out, I could stop taking the required classes that didn't interest me and begin dropping in on the ones that looked far more interesting. It wasn't all romantic. I didn't have a dorm room, so I slept on the floor in friends' rooms. 
I returned Coke bottles for the five cent deposits to buy food with. And I would walk the seven miles across town every Sunday night to get one good meal a week at the Hare Krishna temple. I loved it. And much of what I stumbled into by following my curiosity and intuition turned out to be priceless later on. Let me give you one example. Reed College at that time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, every poster, every label on every drawer was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, I decided to take a calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can't capture, and I found it fascinating. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me. And we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no personal computer would have them. <laughs> if I had never dropped out, I would have never dropped in on that calligraphy class, and personal computers might not have the wonderful typography that they do. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Okay, so uh, all of the beautiful fonts that we, I mean, how many fonts do you have on your computer? A thousand, fifteen hundred? Uh, this is what computer fonts looked like when I was growing up. And this is what they look like now because of Steve Jobs, because he took a calligraphy class and learned all of these old things that we were talking about today. Now, I cannot teach calligraphy. If you've seen my handwriting, it's horrible. Uh, any questions about writing? Okay, I'm going to do something dangerous and stop recording so I can put that up separately from Exodus. And then I'll re-crank it up and make a new recording. Fingers crossed.